Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tarek Odali from Business Review, and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have Environment One Corporation with us today, who will be discussing preventing catastrophe, detecting and locating generator hotspots. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received via email and you'll be able to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions today, you can send them in at any time via the questions widget. So just type them into the box at the top left-hand corner of your screen, then click Submit. We'll try to allocate some time at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. If you click on the green resource list widget at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to view or download some PDF files relevant to this webinar. Please use the yellow help widget if you require any technical assistance, and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. Today's guest speaker, Steve Kilmartin, is the Director of Products and Markets for E1's Utility Systems business. Considered a leading expert in the field of generator monitoring and maintenance, he has authored numerous papers, including work as Principal Investigator for the EPRI Turbine Generator Auxiliary Systems Volumes 3 Generator Hydrogen System Maintenance Guide. Mr. Kilmartin began his career with E1 in 1988 as an instrument specialist. Prior, he worked in the instrument shop at GE and also as an applications engineer at Mechanical Technology Incorporated in New York. His career has taken him in and around large machines and around the world for more than 30 years. So now, without any further ado, please allow me to welcome today's speaker, Steve. Thank you, Tarek. During this webinar, I will discuss hotspot detection in hydrogen in air-cooled generators. Typically, when properly proper operating procedures are followed, large synchronous electric generators are very reliable. However, generators can and do fail. Many generator failure modes are common and can be predicted and or prevented. Some examples of why generators can fail are design flaws, operating issues, contamination or foreign objects because of mechanical and electrical stresses put on the generators. This is a picture of a generator with end winding that had end winding issues. And you can see the burning on the ends of this generator. Some failures cannot be prevented, but early detection of the problem followed by prompt corrective action can mean the difference between a brief shutdown for minor repairs and a major overhaul or a major overhaul involving weeks or months of costly downtime. This is a picture of a generator that experienced a core failure. You can see the burning. Early detection of this problem could have minimized the damage done to this generator. Also, today's operating conditions increase the chances of generator failures. Generator fleets are getting older. Periods between outages are getting longer and longer. Generators are being cycled more, and the grid is becoming less stable due to the renewable energies and the power industry workforce is also getting leaner. This is a picture of a generator with N-turn issues, and again, you can see the burning on the, these windings. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is about hotspot detection in large synchronous generators. I will be discussing two different technologies. One for detecting hotspots in hydrogen-cooled generators, which uses an ion chamber as the detector, and one which is used to detect hotspots in air-cooled generators, 
which uses a cloud chamber as a detector. Generator cooling schemes will vary depending on the size of the generator and manufacturer of the generator. For example, Alstom and Siemens will build very large air-cooled generators in the, in the area of three, 300 and 400 megawatts, while General Electric will use hydrogen to cool the same size generators and even smaller. GE will use hydrogen to cool generators as small as 100 and 125 megawatts. So generators can either be cooled with air, they can be cooled with a combination of air and water, they can be cooled with hydrogen, or a combination of hydrogen and water, and the components inside the generator can be either directly cooled, this means the cooling gas comes in contact with the component being cooled, or indirectly cooled, where that component had the, the heat from that component has to be re, uh, travel through metal before it is cooled. The generators are also axial or radially cooled. The next two slides are of sectioned views of generators. This generator could be, the generator that we're looking at here could be a air-cooled generator or it could be a hydrogen-cooled generator. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to explain some of the components on this generator, but I can't use the cursors so that you can see. But on the right-hand side, you have some seals and the collector ring on the rotor. You can notice the blades on the rotor also. This is uh, for the fan to circulate the air or the hydrogen and cooling the generator. And then you have the, the rotor itself with the retaining rings, the core, the windings going through the core. And with this generator, anywhere the air is touching the component, these devices that I will be talking about will detect overheating. So it doesn't have to be, the, the, the hot spot doesn't have to be in an area such as an RTD would try to uh, detect it. It doesn't have to be in the area of the hot spot. This is a sectioned view of a hydrogen cooled generator. Um, the, the, the yellow arrows on this may be difficult to see, but you can see on this that hydrogen is cooling the end windings, it's cooling under the retaining rings of the rotor, hydrogen is cooling within the body of the rotor and the windings of the rotor. There are uh, a blower on the left-hand side of this rotor that will circulate the hydrogen. Hydrogen is cooling down into bushing and lower leads. And then you can see the top has a uh, heat exchanger to remove the uh, heat from the hydrogen. So wherever these yellow arrows that you see on this uh, section view of the generator are touching components, these detectors that I'm going to be talking about will detect overheating in these units. The next couple slides are of typical monitoring equipment that is used on generators. Some of this equipment is standard design, standard supply with the piece of equipment. It will be supplied with new generators as standard equipment, and others are optional. Uh, you have N-turn vibration, which uses uh, fiber optics or accelerometers to detect the vibration of the end windings. Shaft and rotor imbalance, again, this is a, a vibration sensor. This is typically, you will typically get one sensor uh, with a generator. The bigger the generator, the more sensors you will have. Stator winding insulation deterioration, uh, partial discharge can be used to monitor this condition. 
This is typically an optional piece of equipment. Moisture is uh, detected using a dew point analyzer. Gas purity is detected using thermal conductivity. Uh, this is a very important monitor, not only during the normal operation of the generator, knowing what your hydrogen purity is, but also during the purging of the generator, when you're degassing and gassing the generator, you also want to know what the gas, gas concentration is during those phases also. Electric overload relays, protective relays, these are equipped, all, new, all generators that come with protective relays. Now some of these will be used on air-cooled generators, some of them will be used on hydrogen-cooled generators, and some of them can be used on both. Uh, equipment like the moisture and gas purity, those would only be used on hydrogen cooled generators. Here are some more monitors and examples. Uh, rotor winding shorts uh, using an air gap search coil to detect uh, rotor winding shorts. Uh, arcing and insulation breakdown, you can use a radio frequency monitor for those. Excessive temperature. Now this is, the, this is an important one because all generators come with at least one or two thermocouples or RTDs. The larger the generator and the, the importance of the generator usually will have more RTDs and thermocouples. So you, you can have a, let's say a minimum of two or up in the neighborhood of 30. And then overheating and arcing, this is what I'm going to be talking about, uh, generator condition monitors, again, for both air-cooled and hydrogen-cooled generators to detect overheating and arcing in a generator. These are some materials that you will find inside the generator. Both these detecting principles I will be discussing are looking for submicron particles or thermal breakdown or thermal particulates that are created when a material thermally breaks down. Under normal operating conditions, there are no submicron particles in the cooling gas. When a thermal event takes place, you go from having no submicron particles to having millions of submicron particles. These submicron particles are what we are looking for or detecting. <clears throat> this slide shows some materials you will find in the generator and the temperatures at which these materials will start to thermally break down. You can see the uh, core plate or the insulating plate material. One of the important ones here is turbine oil. You're not supposed to have turbine oil in a generator, but if you do, if turbine oil is overheated, it will particulate and it will cause a, a verified alarm in an air-cooled or hydrogen-cooled generators. Generator condition monitors will let you know when you have a hot spot in the generator. However, they will not indicate where the hot spot is. Much like a fire detector in your house, which will tell you when you have a problem, but will not tell you where the problem is. You need to locate the problem. The last item, gen tags, are a chemical that is added to the insulating paint of the generator so that if the insulating paint starts to break down, these gen tag chemicals will be emitted and you can identify the location of the hot spot in the generator. These, these gen tags are applied to the turbine end winding, they are applied to the collector end winding, they are applied to the stator ID, they are applied to the rotor OD, and they are applied to the bushings and lower leads of the generator. So again, with a generator condition monitor, whether it's for air-cooled or hydrogen-cooled generators, it will detect overheating in the generator, but it will not tell you the area in the generator that is overheating. With gen tags, with this chemical, 
you can identify the problem that is overheat the area in the generator that is overheating. Thermal particulation or thermal degradation, it's not subtle. Uh, you, you either have zero submicron particles in the generator or you have millions of submicron particles in the generator. So there's a dramatic signal change in the pieces of equipment. With a generator condition monitor the out, for hydrogen-cooled machines, the output will drop when these submicron particles are available. With a air-cooled generator, these submicron, when submicron particles are present, the output will go up. Because a generator is sealed, at least in a hydrogen-cooled generator, the, the submicron particles are contained within the generator, which helps, makes it easier for them to be detected. There's only one source uh, for submicron particles in a generator. And that's thermal. They have to, they, they, there has to be a hot spot or overheating. You cannot create submicron particles by vibration or oil whipping off of a, a rotor. There has to be a hot spot in the generator to cause these submicron particles to occur. There's minimal interference, again, because most generators are sealed. And minimal mass will give you an early warning. Uh, the, the size of the hot spot can be in the neighborhood of the, the size of a cell phone. A uh, very small area will give you a indication that you have overheating in the generator. First I will discuss the generator condition monitor for hydrogen cooled generators which I will refer to as a GCMX. This piece of equipment can be referred to as a generator condition monitor, core monitor, uh, or, or as I will refer to it as a GCMX. And it uses an ion chamber to detect the thermal particulates or the hot spots in the generator. This is a piping diagram of a GCMX connected to the generator. The GCMX relies on the fan in the hydrogen cooled generator to circulate or create a differential pressure which will create the flow through the generator condition monitor. You can see in the upper left hand corner, the little rectangle, that's the generator. You can see the inlet line coming down from the middle dot. It goes through a drip leg to re help remove oil. Then it goes through an oil moisture trap. Then it enters the GCMX. And then on the other side, it enters the GCMX from the left-hand side. The other side of the GCMX, the right-hand side, the, you see an optional oil moisture trap. And then it returns to the generator suction side. That optional oil moisture trap is there because the oil can drip down even though the hydrogen flow is returning to the generator. It is possible for oil to drip down that pipe and enter into the generator condition monitor. Then you have another optional line that is coming from the generator case, goes through the GCMX and this is for the auto sampling system and in the next slide you will see where this connection is made. Uh, on this installation, there's also a pressure gauge that is used to, to make sure that we're connected to the generator and that the piece of equipment is valved in and we're getting a, the, reading the generator case pressure. This is a schematic of the GCMX internal piping. Uh, this, this unit shows a, a four flange unit. Uh, you can see the flanges on the right hand and the left hand side. On the left hand side, the bottom flange is, flange is the inlet. The hydrogen comes in that line from the pressure of the fan, bypasses the filter, goes around the filter through the ion chamber, 
Then it goes out the outlet, the, the other flange, the outlet flange on the right-hand side returns to the generator suction. So as long as the generator is spinning, we got a flow of hydrogen through this ion chamber. You can see that we use a differential pressure transmitter to monitor the flow through the ion chamber. There's a flow set valve. Now th this unit has a four flange. Uh, you can see on the top left-hand side, there's an air, a flange that connects to the generator case. In the event that you have verified alarm or overheating in the generator, that solenoid valve will open. A flow of hydrogen will go through that collector, goes through a flow meter, and then goes to vent. That collector is used to collect a sample for laboratory analysis, and this analysis can either be an organic analysis to prove, confirm that the generator condition monitor did go into an alarm, or it can collect the gen tag that I spoke of earlier to identify the location of the alarm. It's very important to note that under normal conditions, the hydrogen is bypassing that filter and going through the ion chamber because that filter is what's used to confirm when an alarm ought to automatically confirm when an alarm is real. And then you can see down in the lower right-hand corner, there's an explosion-proof enclosure. This is where all the electronics are housed that control the unit. This is a picture of the ion chamber that is used as the detecting de device. This device is about uh, 3 inches in diameter, about 12 inches long, and I don't know what that converts to to metric. But uh, uh, again, three, about three inches in diameter, about 12 inches long. And this is what's used to detect the submicron particles. This is a sectioned view of the ion chamber. And how this operates is that hydrogen flows in the connection on the left-hand side. Hydrogen inside the ion chamber, there's an alpha source. The hydrogen carries the alpha particles that are being emitted from the alpha source essentially between two parallel plates on the right-hand side. And one of these plates or the, the, the rod is positively charged so that when these, these alpha particles enter between these two plates, you're creating a very small current with those positively charged alpha particles. And what we do is we take and amplify that signal. It's a picoamp signal. We amplify that. And if you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, there's two bar graphs. The first bar graph is monitoring the flow, which is very important. You have to have the proper flow for the ion chamber to work. The second bar graph is monitoring the output of the ion chamber. And this is typically set at 80%. So under normal conditions, when the generator is spinning and you have proper hydrogen flow and the electronics are working properly, the ion chamber is working properly, you will have 50% flow indication and 80% on the, the ion chamber output indication. When you have overheating in the generator, you're, you're creating, as I said, millions of these submicron particles. These submicron particles are carried by the hydrogen into the ion chamber. These submicron particles are heavy, and the alpha particles attach to the submicron particles. And because they're heavier, when they go between the two parallel plates, the collector assembly on the right-hand side, the positively charged alpha particles just go right past and do not attach to the probe, and you lose that current that you were creating. So you can see on this 
slide, we've got the current being created by the positively charged alpha particles. And with this, one, this slide, the positively charged alpha particles are, go, are not creating the current. They're going right by the, the probe, and you lose that picoamp current. And you can see down in the bar graph, your output drops down below an alarm point, was, which is 50%. So again, under normal conditions, clean hydrogen, you have a flow at 50%. You have an output at 80%. When you have overheating in the generator, your flow stays the same at 50%, but your output drops below the alarm point, which is 50%. Now, the way that we verify that this alarm is real is that we insert the filter that's in front of the ion chamber. This filter removes the submicron particles that are created by the overheating. And when you remove those submicron particles, the output of the ion chamber goes back up to 80%. So just to state this one more time. Normal conditions, clean hydrogen, the output's 80%. When you have submicron particles that are being created by overheating, the output drops below the alarm point, which is 50%. At that time, the filter is inserted. The filter removes the submicron particles. We now have clean hydrogen again, and the output goes back up to 80%. It's at that point that I've got a verified alarm and the top solenoid valve opens up, and I collect a sample for laboratory analysis. So the alarm verification uh, is, is a three-step process under normal operating conditions. Again, the output is 80%. It will go into a warning at 70%. And it will begin the alarm verification sequence at 50%. So particles present, it's 50%. The filter's energized. The output goes back up to 80%, goes above 50%, back up to 80%. And then after a, a given time period, the filter's de-energized, and the output drops down below 50%. That's, that's when we know that we got a verified alarm in the piece of equipment. It's very important to understand this because the generator condition monitor output, in order to read 80%, again, you have to have a proper hydrogen flow. The electronics in the generator GCMX have to be working properly, and the ion chamber has to be working properly. If all those conditions are met, and there's some micron particles in the unit, the output will drop below the alarm point, again, which is 50%. It will go through an alarm verification sequence to give you the verified alarm. If the output drops because of flow or because the electronics aren't operating properly or is because the ion chamber isn't operating properly, if the output drops because of those three reasons, it will give you a trouble indication. It will not give you a verified alarm. Only when you have overheating in the generator will you get a verified alarm uh, out of this piece of equipment. Now I'm going to talk about the GCMA, which is the device that is used to monitor for overheating in air-cooled generators. Because air-cooled generators can be an open system, not like a hydrogen-cooled generator that's got a uh, sealed system, the, the GCMA has to have a more sensitive detecting device. The air-cooled GCMA, uh, the, the Generator Condition Monitor for Air-Cooled Machines, uses what is called a Wilson Cloud Chamber or Cloud Chamber 
to detect thermal particulates or submicron particles. This type of monitor has become popular in recent years because the output of air-cooled generators is getting larger and larger. As I mentioned earlier, Alstom and uh, Siemens will build air-cooled generators that are in the neighborhood of 300 and 400 megawatts. So they're pushing the, the design limits of this, these generators and creating a need for a monitor that will detect hot spots in these large air-cooled generators. As I mentioned, hydrogen-cooled generators are a closed-loop cooling system. And because of that, we can use an ion chamber as a detector. It's very well suited to detect some micron particles in hydrogen-cooled generators. On air-cooled generators, uh, although there are some designs that are sealed, uh, called TWAC units, or totally enclosed units, but because they can be an open system, you need a more sensitive detecting device, and that's why we use a Wilson cloud chamber. Uh, the Wilson cloud chamber is not only sensitive, but it's immune to false alarms that could be created by dust or dirt in the machine. Submicron sized particles are of great interest because during a thermal event, they increase exponentially per second. They, they increase very rapidly. And again, I, I, as I mentioned, there's no other phenomena in the generator that will produce particles in, in this large number. Making the, and one, one thing I didn't mention is that these submicron particles are invisible. So making these minute particles visible and continuously monitoring their concentration pro provides for an ideal means to monitor an air-cooled generator for arcing or overheating. If there is a rapid increase in submicron particles, it's, it, there's, there's no question that it's a thermal or an arcing event that's taken place in the generator. And when, I, when I'm talking about an arcing event, that could be any an electrical arc or a shorted turn that might occur in a rotor that, that could cause an electrical arc. So the, the Wilson Cloud Chamber, again, is an excellent device to do, make these invisible particles visible. And I'm going to explain how this operates in the next slide. But what, essentially what it's doing, it's taking uh, an invisible particle that we can't see, <clears throat> putting a droplet of water around it so that we can see it. And so we're using uh, humidified air in order to do that. Invisible particle concentration becomes visible. We're monitoring this with an LED, so that's what, that's what the output of this piece of equipment is, is the LED from a, the cloud chamber. This is a section view of the cloud chamber. How this works is that the sample comes in the bottom of the unit. There's an inlet port. This sample becomes super saturated. <clears throat> and then we have a rapid pressure change in the unit, which takes and forms a water droplet around these submicron particles. In the top of this cloud chamber device, you can see an LED, a light emitting diode, and then you can see a photocell. When the air is clean and there's no particles, uh, obviously that photocell will detect the beam from the LED. When 
there's submicron particles that are being created inside the generator. They get a water droplet in this device forms around these submicron particles and they become visible, which obscures the signal that's coming from the LED and that then we get a signal out of the photocell that we got a problem or we've got overheating that's taken place in the generator. As I mentioned earlier, when operating under normal conditions, there are no submicron particles in a generator, whether, whether it's air-cooled or hydrogen-cooled. When a thermal event takes place, we go, it's very important to note that we go from zero to million submicron particles in the, in the generator cooling gas. This cloud chamber, as I said, is a very sensitive device that can effectively detect these submicron particles. What I, I, the next, next couple slides are, are, are somewhat wordy, so I'm going to uh, just tell you a little bit about this piece of equipment. This piece of equipment was designed, this cloud chamber was to, designed to de, be, be a very sensitive detector. It was used to detect diesel submarines uh, because the air in the ocean is very clean. Uh, a diesel submarine would give off submicron particles, and this device could be used to detect uh, diesel submarines. This, this, this detector was used to protect the Hubble ta Space Telescope when it was on the ground. Uh, it, it was used to detect the Constitution of the United States. It's a very early warning uh, sensor. It's a sensor that you want to detect the overheating before there's actually flames or fires. With a GCMA, you got to monitor the ambient air and the generator cooling air. Uh, that's, and the reason for that is because with an air-cooled generator that is an open system that has cooling air going through it uh, continuously, you, if you had a fork truck or an arc welding uh, event that's taking place next to the generator, both of those would create submicron particles that would look like overheating in the generator. As a result, you want to monitor the ambient air to make sure those submicron particles aren't coming from the ambient air, and you want to me measure the generator cooling air. The GCMA has a warning and an alarm level, which are uh, selectable and adjustable. If the generator cooling air increases without a corresponding increase in the ambient signal, signal then you know that the those particles are be, being created inside the generator. So again, if you have a, let's say someone's welding outside of an air-cooled generator, <clears throat> by monitoring the ambient air and generator air, the ambient air will go up in uh, signal concentration and the generator air will go up in signal concentration. Now you know that the Submicron particles are coming from outside the generator. If the ambient air remains low and the generator signal goes up, now you know you've got a you've got the overheating taking place in the generator. And uh, at this point, there's a dis differential and alarm that confirms that there's overheating in the generator. The GCMA consists of the monitor itself, which contains the electronics, a vacuum pump, blower, which is used to create a flow through the unit. That's, that's an important difference between the <clears throat> GCMX and GCMA, that the GCMA relies on a blower to circulate the air from the generator. 
the, again, the, the, the system consists of the GCMA, which houses all the electronics. There's a zone manifold, which is used to balance the airflow into the unit. There's sample pipe, PVC pipe can be used to connect this unit to the generator. There's sample heads that are used outside of the generator, and you'll see these in the next couple of slides. Uh, they're, they're used to monitor the ambient air. Then there's a sample probe that is inserted inside the generator to collect the sample of air that we're actually monitoring. This, this picture, you can see two bar graphs. On the left-hand side, the one bar graph is the ambient air. The second bar graph is the generator cooling air. And then you see the uh, in the middle, there's six squares. These squares are warnings and verified, uh, are warning and alarm lights for the ambient air, generator air, and differential. The right-hand panel is the control panel for setting this up. Pretty simple device. Uh, pretty this this device you can actually put resistors painted with epoxy paint inside the generator and overheat them to confirm that this piece of equipment is operating as it should. With a hydrogen cooled machine, that's a little bit more difficult. But with an air cooled machine, uh, you 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 can use insulated coated resistors to confirm that this piece of equipment is operating properly. This is a picture of a once through generator and this kind of gives you an idea of how the GCMA is connected. Um, where the blue arrows are entering the generator, that's the inlet cooling air, uh, that, that's a filter housing up there, and that's where we put our ambient, cool, our ambient heads that will detect the ambient air. The air will come in through this filter housing, go down through the generator, it passes the components in the generator, and then it exits out the right-hand side and we have some heads, sample heads there also, and that's monitoring the generator air. So you can see we're monitoring the inlet air or ambient air and the outlet air or the generator cooling air. If both of the signals, the ambient air and the cooling air, both of those go up, that's an indication that the part, submicron particles are coming from the outside world. If only the generator cooling air signal goes up, then now we know we did, that we've got overheating, that the submicron particles are be, being created inside the generator. This is a, a closed air-cooled generator. Now it's a little bit easier to detect submicron particles in, in a closed generator because it's sealed much like a hydrogen cooled generator. Now, even though it is sealed, some of these units will have vents that can be open to uh, allow more cooling air to come into the generator or ambient cooling air to, to come into the generator. So, so we still want to monitor the ambient air on these generators. Uh, I, I can tell you of an incident where we were monitoring the, a system like this. We had a GCMA on a system like this. And what took place is that the collector rings were overheating on the generator. Now, that's external to the generator. But the collector rings were overheating. This took place at, at the very early hours in the morning, so there was no work or, or no fork trucks or anything being operated at the plant. We detected the overheating of the, those collector rings with the ambient air. So the ambient air went into an alarm. 
Uh, again, it was uh, in the neighborhood of 3 o'clock in the morning. The, the, there shouldn't have been no submicron particles in the ambient air. They uh, investigated it and found out that the ambient air had detected overheating in the collector ring of that generator. So there are other benefits of to monitor the ambient air of these generators. In summary, both units, the GCMX and the GCMA, use detectors that are very effective in detecting some micron particles that are created by overheated materials, such as insulation. Both are well suited for the applications that they are being used in, and both can help ensure reliable operation of hydrogen and air-cooled generators, helping to minimize the chances of a catastrophic generator failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we're going to move into the Q&A session. So audience members, if you would like to ask a question, please send them in via the questions widget. So just type them into the box at the top left-hand corner of your screen and then click Submit. So we're going to try to make some time for a few questions here. First one is, what will be the implication of turbine oil accumulation in the generator? That's, that's, that's a very good question, and I'll give, it, I'll give an answer for both pieces of equipment. If, if turbine oil enters the ion chamber, what it does is it coats the alpha source, and the alpha source then becomes ineffective. It's no, no longer creating alpha particles. So what will happen in the, uh, in, in the ion chamber is that the output will go down but when, it, the, but when it tries to confirm the alarm, the output won't go back up because the uh, filter is not removing particles and the ion chamber is no lo longer operating properly. So in a hydrogen-cooled machine, liquid oil will cause the ion chamber to no longer function. Now on an air-cooled machine, uh, it's very rare to have uh, oil in the, in the generator. But again, oil will affect uh, the, the cloud chamber. Um, so when using both of these devices, it's very important that you take proper practices, proper piping practices to minimize the chances of oil either entering a GCMX or a GCMA. It's, 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 again, it's, it's critical that you keep oil out of these machines. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on straight away to the next question, why do we need GCMX or GCMA if our generator already has RTDS and thermocouples, or RTDs, sorry? As I mentioned in the, uh, when I was discussing the, the GCMX, generators can be, generators, uh, all generators are equipped with either RTDs or thermocouples. However, the number of RTDs and thermocouples that they are supplied with is very small. They can be very small. So the thermocouple or RTD has to be physically located next to the hot spot in order to detect it. Now some thermocouples and RTDs will detect the hot gas temperature and the cold gas temperature. Now in that case, the, the hot spot has to be hot enough and large enough to change the hydrogen gas temperature. And that, that's very unlikely. So the, the, the advantage of using a GCMX or a GCMA, they are detecting overheating wherever hydrogen or air is touching the component in the generator, 
which is pretty much the whole generator. With an RTD or thermocouple, the hotspot either has to be severe enough or physically located close to the RTD or thermocouple in order for it to, to be detected. Okay, thank you. And next question is, is the capability of GCMX or GCMA dependent on the size of the generator? Not at all. Uh, I've, I've had, and when, it, when they say the size of the generator, I'm, I'm assuming they mean either the physical size or the size of the, how many megawatts are being created by the generator. But uh, I, I've, we, we have GCMXs installed on hydrogen-cooled generators that are as small as 25 megawatts. So the size on a hydrogen-cooled generator uh, really doesn't matter. On an air-cooled generator, it, 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 it's the same. We can be, use a GCMA on units as small as 10 megawatts or as large as 400 megawatts, as long as we have air circulating in the generator that we can get to, that we can monitor the inlet air and monitor the cooling air. The, the, both of these pieces of equipment can be used on any size hydrogen or air-cooled generator. Where it becomes, uh, where you have to make a judgment is the importance of the generator. How critical is that generator to be kept online? Uh, because if, uh, if a hot spot occurs and you, you lose that generator. Now let me make a comment here is that a GCMX or a GCMA might not, well, might, will not eliminate the problem, the hot spot. What it will do is it will give you an early enough warning so that you can take action so that that hot spot doesn't grow, so it, which could mean the difference of a uh, couple day outage versus a couple months or six months outage. So it doesn't doesn't eliminate the problem. It just helps you minimize the problem. Thank you very much. We're going to try to get to just a couple more before we end today. So this one is, um, what kind of maintenance is required on these systems, and how frequently does that maintenance need to be carried out? That, that, that varies on, on both pieces of equipment. The GCMX is very much what we refer to as a fit and forget piece of equipment. It, it gets installed and it, if, if the generator is a base load generator, it will not need to be adjusted or looked at. Now, I always recommend that the piece of equipment be looked on a, a, a per shift basis. So an operator will walk by, verify that the flow is correct, and verify that the output is correct. Um, however, this isn't necessary. I only recommend it so that they're paying attention to it. Now the GCMA, on the other hand, does require some maintenance, and it, it uses, as as I mentioned, it uses water, so that you have to check this water periodically, and because it's monitoring ambient air, which can sometimes be dirty, uh, there's filters on the sampling heads and filters on the manifold that sometimes have to be changed. So the GCMX is pretty much a, again, for fit and forget piece of equipment. <coughs> Very little maintenance is required. How would, however, with a GCMA, there is a little bit of maintenance that is required. And I did mention changing the oil, or oil, changing the water. And this water typically will, uh, the, the reservoir will, of water will last uh, two to three months, depending on how dry the air is. Okay, next question is, um, will the GCMX or GCMA be suitable for a marine environment or ship fit MV generator where oil fumes are present in ambient air? I, I, I'm not sure 
if the if when they say marine environment, if they got a hydrogen cooled generator or a air cooled generator, then, but but they're asking the question for both. So if there's oil in the ambient air on a hydrogen cooled machine, it will have no effect because the, the hydrogen generator is sealed. If there's oil in the air on a GCMA, an air-cooled generator, you would have to take uh, piping practices, follow pi proper piping practices to remove that oil, those oil fumes. And there are filters that will remove the oil film but will allow submicron particles to pass. So there are filters that can be used that, will, uh, again, will, will remove oil, the oil vapor, oil film, but will allow submicron particles from overheating to pass through the unit. Okay, lovely. And uh, one quick question now. Uh, how small of a hotspot will the GCMA or GCMX detect? Um, it, it, as I mentioned in the slide uh, earlier in the slide, I, I said this very quickly. But both units will detect an area, and I'll use a, a, a cell phone, uh, about the size of a cell phone, um, and, and, and I can say two square inches, but I don't know what, again what that is in millimeters. But uh, a pretty small area, about the size of a cell phone. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much um, for those answers, and thank you to everyone for asking those questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions that we, uh, we received today, but um, your questions will be forwarded on if they haven't been answered live, and you should expect a response soon. So that just leaves me to thank Steve for what was a great presentation, and of course to thank Environment One Corporation for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you will receive an email very shortly, and that will tell you how you can access the on-demand version of the webinar. Or you can access this directly through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on that website, or follow us on Twitter. That's at BR Webinars for daily updates. Please join our LinkedIn group as well. That's Business Review Webinars. Stephen, is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience before we end the webinar today? I, I'd just like to mention that Environment One will be participating at the Power Gen Asia show, which is in Seoul, South Korea. It is between September 20th and September 22nd. And if anyone would like to learn more uh, about this piece of equipment, there will be someone in our booth that can uh, go into more detail than I did on how this piece of equipment operates. And Environment One will be in stand C71 if anyone is interested. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for your attention today. Uh, I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.